if if there is one big thing to understand about publishing, it is that it is a team sport, and you need a bunch of other people to to be excited about your book in order for it to succeed. Honestly, like other other industries have like a, a five hundred times markup. You know, you go into like J Crew and you buy a forty dollar T shirt that costs them cents to actually make. And it is not like that in publishing. Uh, we do not make a lot of money. It runs a hell of a lot more on enthusiasm than it does on dollars. And, uh, and so my first step, once I find something I'm excited about, is to share it with the other children's editors at our editorial meeting. And we talk about it there. And, and we sort of kick the tires a little bit. And then it goes on to our acquisitions meeting. And at Chronicle, that's a little different from a lot of other publishers. Um, most publishers, an editor has to go through a kind of gauntlet at that stage where you stand in front of the head of sales and the head of publishing and the, you know, the head of marketing and a bunch of you know, grumpy and sometimes not very imaginative people and you know, wave your hands and be like, I know it looks like this right now, but it's going to be like this at some point. And and uh, you know, Chronicle used to work that way back, oh gosh, maybe 14 years ago. Um, and we found that when we did things that way, what we frequently heard in that meeting was, we can't sell that. And we found that if we published the book anyway, they could sell that. <laughs> so uh, we took sales out of the acquisitions decisions and we set up the publishing groups that I was talking about. The publishing groups include the editors, children, like the children's publisher group includes the children's editors, the children's designers, the children's part, uh, production managers, and children's marketing and publicity. And, and there's just more trust and more risk taking in those meetings now that we've changed that system. And about two years later, when the first book started coming out onto the market that we had acquired under the new system, our profits started to go straight up. Yep. So we're, we're in a pretty healthy position as a publishing house. And um, a lot of that comes down to the, the trust in our creative teams and the, the leeway to be creative. And so once that book has been approved by your, yeah. the edit, editorial group, um, how long does it take to go through the process and everything until it becomes um, a published book? The fastest I've ever seen is a year. Um, that's very fast, though. Um, most take at least two years, and sometimes, sometimes stuff happens, and it's significantly longer than that. Uh, mm -hmm. Publishing is is not a great thing to do, like as a hobby, or because you're like, oh, I just want to publish this one book. Like, sweet, sweet, darling, creative people. I, I have. I, I'm I'm worried for for those people because they may find it much much longer than they anticipated and and more complicated too, but the people who go into it really like excited to have a career as a writer, those people will generally make it because they take it seriously. They learn a lot and they write a bunch of things. You learn so much from writing more than one book, and the longer you spend in publishing. Um, you know, learning about it, you, you make smarter decisions, not just about your own books, though you do, but also smarter decisions about your career and the people you work with. And, and all of those things will, will contribute to making you a happier person. Okay, thank you. I have, I have numerous questions. They just keep popping up as you're talking. I realize we're getting close to the time which we should turn this over. So um, I'm not even sure. We didn't even go into your background. I just, it would be interesting to hear from you um, what you thought you would do when you were a teenager. Was publishing already something on your horizon no. at that point? Uh, no. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And um, in high school, I got, I got all of the grades. Um, a, B, C, D, F. Like, I got all of them. And, uh, <laughs> and then I took a year off and um, spent a year in the California Conservation Corps, which is now the AmeriCorps. And after that, I spent a couple of years in a community college. And um, like the, my experience in the AmeriCorps really sort of underlined to me how lucky I was to have the chance to go to college, because not, not all kids do. 
And so I went to the community college and uh, busted ass and uh, got some straight A's and uh, switched to a, a university. And, um, and it was while I was in college that I started, I got a part-time job um, at a children's bookstore. And I found I loved selling children's books. And I did that for many years, but then I was getting like towards the end of my twenties and thinking, man, maybe I should try to find a job that has healthcare or retirement plan. And uh, it was only then that I thought maybe publishing. Wow. Yeah. So I, um, I interned at Chronicle and back then this was 16 years ago, back then, um, the interns were not paid. <laughs> um, I know that. <laughs> Yes, you know that. Full disclosure, I was an intern at Chronicle too. <laughs> That's right. Um, they are paid now. And oh, good. Benefits and vacation time, and and the it's it's a fellowship now, and the editorial fellows are with us for a full year. Um, it's really turned into a pretty terrific program. Um, to stop you on that, to it, for the fellowship program, what are the requirements? Does one have to have completed high school or college? No, you're shaking. Um, I would. I would say probably high school. I don't know if we've actually actually made any firm rules about that, but we don't insist on college. Um, we're, we're trying to make it as open as we can make it, but it is, it is meant to be a job that ideally leads straight into editorial assistantship. And an editorial assistant is the, the first level, basically, in, in the path towards editorship. Um, so yeah, I think somebody asked what my degree was in. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It was classics. And uh, just in case you're thinking, oh, that means Dickens or Shakespeare. No, it doesn't. It means um, ancient Greek and Latin and those civilizations. Um, so I, I got a lot of, so what are you going to do with that? And I had no idea. But the, the bottom line is that in, in, a lot of, in a lot of jobs that are not very, very specific. I mean, if you want to be an engineer, then you need an engineering degree. Um, but a lot of jobs, they don't care what you got your degree in. They just generally kind of want you to have one. Very true. Uh, someone wrote, can you remind us which, uh, Lauren wrote, which children's bookstore? Did you say you were working at a children's bookstore? I, I started at a children's bookstore called The Storyteller in Lafayette, California. It is no longer around. Um, the owner, it, business was great, but the owner decided she was ready to retire and she just could not find anyone that she wanted to hand her baby off to. So <laughs> now I help out Sunday mornings at uh, Book Passage in Corte Madera because it's, it turned out to be very difficult for me to give up book selling completely. Apparently. And why does it, I, I mean, I assume that it helps inform your work as a book editor. Is that part of why you keep on with it or you just like the interaction? It's both of those. Um, I love, it, it really does help me as an editor because it keeps me very current in what's going on in the market and, you know, what, what other books are out there. But it's also that I have kind of a compulsion to recommend books to people. And, um, you know, when... I, honestly, I had that compulsion when I was a teenager. And when you're a teenager and you're just sort of lurking in a children's section of some bookstore and eavesdropping on people so that you can recommend books to them, it's not as creepy as when you're 30 years old. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> it helps to be an official employee of the store, so. <laughs> yes. So uh, someone actually here has a question from CL and this one I was thinking about, I wanted to ask you, but um, can you describe, so some, she says during an author's talk, the author said she would write the story and the publisher would find the illustrator. So that was a point I did want to bring up. If you are an author and you are submitting a book, a children's book, which um, mm -hmm. picture books are pictures in the, the genre, so they are illustrated. Does the author, um, how do you, who do you decide who the illustrator will be? Does the author have any input into that decision? That depends. Um, it, it depends on the publisher or sometimes even just the editor. I really like to involve my authors in the decision about uh, who will illustrate their book, but we don't want authors to come to us with a whole bunch of artist ideas because generally you just don't know as many artists as we do. It's okay if you have some ideas, but 
we'd, we'd like you to be really open-minded about, um, about how, that, how that decision gets made. We, I really want the author to be really excited about the art that ends up in their book because, you know, both, both of the author and the artist have to stand up and, and represent that book and talk to kids about their book and we want them to be really happy about them. Um, but, um, you know, the people who work at a publisher uh, spend a lot of time thinking about artists and know a lot of them and have thought hard about how, how an art style suits a text and how it doesn't. So. And I think uh, I only, yeah, uh, I, I did that fully, I'm sorry, I didn't completely ask her question because I believe uh, she also wanted to know, uh, she said if an author were to submit their own illustrations, mm -hmm. your chances of getting published decreases according to her friend. Is this true for Chronicle? I mean, I would say generally it's true across publishing. Not like, there, there are no absolute answers um, to, to practically any question in publishing. And the only, the only writing advice I can give with absolute certainty is never say never. Uh, but like, unless you have gone to art school and you are like a professional artist, and people are maybe hiring you to and paying you money to illustrate things, then chances are strong your your art is not professional enough to to publish yet. Um, but that's not to say that you can't still send in a submission with your art. I would just make it really clear in this in the cover letter that you're open to somebody else illustrating it if the publisher thinks that the strengths of your art and the strengths of your text are not a great match. I mean, I've, I've gotten submissions from people who illustrated their own book and, and the text was good and the art was good, but the strengths of one and the strengths of the other weren't serving each other. They, they weren't a great match in that way. And so we, we ended up asking the author if they'd be willing for us to find somebody else to illustrate and frequently the answer was yes. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so Lynn, I know we're at the point at which it would be time to switch. Do we have maybe like two minutes to just share a couple of slides? Yeah, so absolutely. Slide show. Just to give you guys a feel, a visual feel for what work, life at Chronicle, working at Chronicle Books is like. Let me go ahead and pull it up right now. It's, uh, and then at the end, if you guys have more questions, we'll go through the questions, but um, we'll do that after Leslie talks. All right, so I have it right here. Um, oops. Go ahead. Oh, there's a lot, so. Don't worry, we're not going through all of these. <laughs> Alyssa, how about numbers? Yeah. Oh, there we go. That's our office. It's on 2nd Street in San Francisco, and that's inside our office. And you, you can really just start flipping through these. <laughs> there are okay. a lot of them. Um, that's, yeah, skip through that. Um, that's our mission statement, blah, blah, blah. This is our history as a, as a publishing Here are some books. Yeah. 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 Um, here are some of the books that we've published. Yep. And we, we do things that aren't books too, as you'll see, like there's, there's a, yeah, Ivy and Bean. Um, and lots of great cookbooks and beautiful art books. And also some things that aren't really books like, um, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, post-it notes that are pot themed or, uh, <laughs> you know, um, the pad of butter. What is that? Uh, it is, it is a pad of paper that is just a uh, little, little slips of yellow paper, but it's made to look like a pad of butter. And that's exactly the kind of crazy thing that happens at Chronicle. <laughs> if, if you had come to me, if, if the team who made this had come to me and said, we want to make a pad of paper, but it looks like a stick of butter. I would have been like, why? No, really, why? But then they make it and somehow they make it so, so compelling looking that you're kind of like, I want to spend money on this, but I don't understand. Um, We're good at that. Um, so yeah, here are some more of our books. Um, just, just, flip 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 <laughs> we we work with a lot of different people these are some of the other things that we've worked on um yep can i can i construction site um a lot of different authors um franchises publishing categories yeah you can see food and drink and lifestyle and art and children's and uh, pop culture there 
And uh, oh, wait, can you go back to that slide? There yeah, this this is what we we call at publishing at, at uh, Chronicle the make team, and that's the editor, the managing editor, the designer, and the production manager. And and those are basically the four people, aside from the author and illustrator, of course, who are who are really like the team making the book. Everybody else at the publisher, sales, marketing, um, accounting, IT, they, they play really important roles, but they play those roles pretty much um, afterwards or outside of the, the process of creating the physical book. These are the four roles that make that book and then we hand it off to the amazing people in marketing and in sales to actually get it into other people's hands. Yep, we, you, you know, once you start looking for the little glasses on the spine, you will find that there are Chronicle books fricking every place. Our salespeople are amazing. You can wander into a tiny little boutique by the ocean that sells nothing but like candles and seashells, and they'll have two books on the counter, and they will be Chronicle books. Um, yeah, so we, we get our books every place around the world, into all kinds of different stores, and. Uh, yeah. Are there any other key slides you want us to look at? I know we're, there's yeah, a lot, so maybe, Lynn, do you want to jump down to, I don't know, ones with pictures there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was Pantone Day at Chronicle. We've been doing some Pantone publishing, and uh, we all came as our favorite color. Um, that's, we, we actually throw a lot of parties. Um, <laughs> Uh, Halloween is is always a really big deal at Chronicle and uh, I still remember the time we had Mardi Gras and production built a float and dragged it through the office throwing candy at people. <laughs> so um, yeah, there, you can find a lot of stuff on our website, which is where some of this is from. There's submissions advice there, there's career advice, there's a lot of information about our, our publishing. Um, these are the ranks of the editorial sort of how, how you get from the beginning to the, the end. Um, as you can see, I'm sort of near the, the middle there, senior editor. Uh, yeah. Um, and there, there are lots of other things to talk about, but I don't think we have the time for yeah. it. <laughs> well, thank you, Melissa. And thanks, Lynn, for sharing the slides. Sure. And of course, we, we can answer more questions towards the end, but um, let's turn it over to... You, Lynn, and Leslie. All right, thank you, Jessica, and thank you, Melissa, for that very informative uh, talk. All right, so Leslie, welcome. Uh, Leslie here, is, Leslie Dutcher, or is it Dutcher, is the Director of Publications at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. And as you can tell, uh, but with the weather here in San Francisco, uh, there in San Francisco, it's actually very cool compared to LA right now. So um, Leslie, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do as Director of Publications? Um, hi, Lynn, and uh, thank you, Lynn and Jessica, for having me here today. It's really nice to have the chance to speak with all of you. And uh, Melissa, I really enjoyed your presentation and uh, learned so much from you. Um, I used to work at Chronicle as well. So uh, we're a very cozy group here. Um, I, I left Chronicle to go to work at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. And in my role at the museums, I am a museum publisher. And when I started out in my publishing career, I didn't even really realize that museums had publishing offices or publishing houses, as is the case in, in my museum, uh, within them who, uh, with persons who are tasked with making books exclusively for the museums. Uh, so I thought I would share a little bit of backdrop about what museum publishing is and then go into the questions that Lynn, you have. So I'm going to share my screen and I hope this works. Um, it did earlier. Yeah. Uh, let's see. One more button. There you go. Uh, uh, publishing at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Um, this slide shows a book that we made uh, in 2013. It's a handbook about one of our museums, the De Young, which is in Golden Gate Park, and some of you have possibly visited there. Um, I, I show this because this is the building that I work in, and actually uh, the, one of the floors is where my, my office is, so it's kind of a fun visual uh, to show. 
to show where I work. Uh, Melissa, are you, <laughs> are you okay? <laughs> I think she's on her cell phone. Anyway, um, so I wanted to talk about museum publishing. It's a little bit different from trade publishing that Melissa described. She talked about acquiring uh, manuscripts from outside authors, choosing the right books to put on their list to sell and to make a profit. And in museum publishing, we are really a service department for the museums. And our job is to uh, create books and other publications that are related to our exhibition program, our permanent collections and other uh, programming at at the museums and so it's a different different kind of model um, so i'll talk as i go through there i only have four slides uh, what a museum publishing office looks like what the different jobs are and what kinds of publications we produce so this is a picture of my bookshelf at my office and uh, it's an office i'm not going to right now because like so many of us we're sheltering in place and um, this shows some of the books that we published in the last 10 years so you can see it's a rather diverse range of topics uh, as I mentioned, we publish exhibition catalogs and books for the permanent collection. Our office oversees also our member magazine, Fine Arts, which comes out three times a year, and gallery didactics, which when you go into an exhibition or you go into galleries at a museum, there's often some context. Uh, there'll be chat panels on the walls or labels with the works of art. And my office is responsible for publishing those materials. And then other museum signage and uh, ephemera, maybe uh, brochures related to curricula, or even uh, we even are responsible for the signs that go on the doors of the bathrooms telling you when the bathroom is closed. So I'm fond of saying that in museum publishing, we really run the gamut of the very scholarly, um, academic kind of uh, catalog to the sign on the bathroom door. Um, I've, I've listed some of our curatorial departments here just to get a sense of the scope of the art book publishing that we do. And um, I thought it would be kind of interesting, Melissa touched upon this in her conversation also, how do you publish a book? A lot of times people think about a few things. They think about writing and they think about editing and they think, oh, and you publish a book. And there are lots of other pieces to that puzzle as Melissa described, um, you know, at the beginning you have a contract. Uh, who's going to do what? The author's going to give the publisher this and the publisher's going to give the author this. Um, there are also a lot of intellectual property rights uh, related to copyright, sometimes trademark. Um, in art book publishing, you have to have the right to use the work of art because the copyright belongs to someone else. And some works are in the public domain and there aren't copyright clearances. But if they are in the public, or if they are outside of the public domain, then you do have to secure permission. And you also have to get the visual image to uh, create a high resolution file so that you can print the book and have very good quality, uh, precise sort of reproductions that mirror the works of art. And that's, of course, uh, very important in museum publishing because we want to promote uh, works in our own collection and works coming in to our exhibition program in the best light possible and with the most faithful reproduction. Um, there's also, when you take a look at a book, you it's always a good thing that you don't think about the way that it's made and all the work that goes into it because it means it was probably done right. Um, I think it's when things go wrong that you start to realize, oh, a letter could be out of alignment or, oh, a page could be upside down. Things could go wrong like that. Um, so there's a lot of creative direction and design uh, decisions that are made. And for us, we like to think about the subject matter of a certain project and we try to tailor the design of the book the look and feel of it to match what that um, what that subject is. And you can kind of see this in the spines of the books. You see something like Summer of Love. Uh, we used a typeface that was derived from typefaces that were popular uh, during the summer of 1967. Um, further to the left, you see some more traditional kinds of typographies. The Masters of Venice, for example, that draw upon a type that was uh, more prevalent in the 17th century. So we think about things like that. Uh, Melissa talked about kind of the dream team, the design dream team. Of course, the book goes into production, into pre-press. You're getting all the images prepared, the InDesign files. 
uh, making everything exactly right. And then of course you go on press and in museum publishing, we really like to send someone on press to make sure that everything is happening as it should. And then as Melissa also mentioned, marketing and selling is kind of the, the final piece. And we are uh, different at the museums in this regard too. We sell through our museum stores and we sell often when you leave an exhibition, you might see uh, a shelf full of books and that's our primary sales venue. Um, this is just a really quick uh, summary of some of our most recent books. Uh, we did a small um, accessory book on Frida Kahlo and her relationship to the city of San Francisco. We are working on a book for um, the first retrospective of the feminist artist Judy Chicago. Uh, down below, Ruth Asawa, uh, Contours in the Air. This is a book that we published 15 years ago. It's been out of print for the last five or six years, and there's been a lot of demand for it, so we created a revised edition uh, just printed this summer. Uh, there's a book about um, uh, Spirit of the Arctic, which is um, based on a permanent collection, but also a part of the collection that has not been highlighted as much as we had hoped it could be, so we created the book. Uh, selected Works is de Young 125. I'm in the midst of that now. If we were in a different room, you'd see all my papers everywhere for that book, which is uh, just getting ready to get handed off to a translation service because we're going to print it in a few different languages. And then uh, the final book you see here is um, Beyond the Uncanny Valley, which is a book about art and artificial intelligence. So a very uh, topical topic. And my last slide, I just wanted to show, uh, this is a page from our website and you can certainly go to our website. I've given the link at the bottom to see some of the different publications that we've done. Often people ask me, do you have a favorite book? And it's very hard to say which one because they're all so interesting and you become very attached to each one as you work on them. And I think as Melissa was saying, with the diversity of different publications, there's so much uh, that I learn along the way. I bring the Contemporary Muslim Fashions book here because this was really a groundbreaking exhibition and catalog. I think it was the first exhibition of its kind. And the book I know has gone into a lot of academic programs uh, after its life within the museums. Uh, people ask me what makes for a good book. And I, I like a book that offers uh, new scholarship, uh, takes on a new topic that perhaps hasn't been explored in other publishing models. And then what distinguishes our publishing list? I'm sure that Melissa could say a lot of things about Chronicle's list and even as you watch her different uh, images go by, you get a sense of that list. And I think for our, our list, um, we are, um, we're very academic, we're looking to increase the knowledge base of our audiences, but we're also very interested in being uh, very accessible and very friendly. So we try to make this a part of our publishing model as well. That books can be very scholarly, but they can also be very beautiful, very appealing, very easy to um, engage with. And I, some of the images from the Contemporary Muslim Fashions catalog at the bottom are shown. And I found this book just a really um, wonderful book to immerse oneself in once it was all published. So I will stop sharing and then I will let you uh, go ahead with whatever questions you have. Uh, that was wonderful. There's so many amazing books at the museums. I'm really, really excited to, to look at them. Um, are, they, are they available online? Will we be able to download them? Uh, so you can, um, you can find the books online with kind of what you saw on the Contemporary Muslim Fashions page, uh, some page spreads, some information about the book, and you have the, there's a link where you can order them through our um, museum store, but we don't have our books online at this time. It is a goal of mine for some of our out of print books uh, that we can put them online in the future. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Okay, well, thank you for sharing all of that. Um, let's go ahead and dive into your career path. So, a director of publications, what, like, how did, what, how did you get there? What, like, what, tell us about your path from when you even began your, your first job to your internship and, and to the many jobs that you've helped to, to get where you are now. 
Um, so I guess going going all the way back, I um, was very involved in my high school newspaper and in the yearbook um, editorial team and a lot of, you know, placing uh, imagery with text and laying it out on the page is very much what I do today. So that spans back, you know, quite a few years now. And um, I studied art and art history and English literature and creative writing. And I spent quite a bit of time sort of battling with myself as to, well, which one of those things is going to win out? What's the thing that I'll really do in my life? And um, it turns out that art book publishing is kind of a happy marriage of the two. I work a lot with the written word and I work a lot with the, you know, the made image. So it's, a, it's been um, kind of feels like the right uh, niche for me uh, with that background. I started my publishing career in New York City. I had a job in, uh, as a subsidiary rights assistant for Simon & Schuster and Scribner's and the free press. And from there, I went to work at Harry Abrams, which was at that time kind of the preeminent art book publisher in the United States and um, did a lot of everything for her at that publishing house. I, I started as a contracts person and then I did a lot of rights and permissions work, then worked my way into proofreading and um, kind of a little bit of photo editing and then some other forms of editing, I kind of got a bit of a collage of different experiences. And then from there, I went to Chronicle in a more uh, focused capacity, working with intellectual property rights and contracts, and then went to the museums as a managing editor and kind of drew back upon um, the, the experiences of the past. But, um, as you saw in both Melissa's presentation and mine, there's so many different things we do as editors and publishers. And so drawing upon all of those different kinds of experiences at the time, I didn't know that, you know, some of that work would be that important to something I would go on to do, but it turned out that it did. And I think what I would say to everyone listening is you never know how these things will kind of come together. And it, you may not do exactly what you're doing, but something about that will be um, important to the thing you end up doing. I love that you mentioned that. Um, you know, you never know, but I feel like you just took a leap of faith and you tried it out and, and look where it took you. Um, what did you have to, um, like what, what were some of the tips that you can give to our teens? Like you said, you took a job at Simon and Schuster. Like, how did you find all of these publishing houses to apply for these jobs? Like what were, what were some of your resources that you used? Um, I used different employment agencies at the time. I think that might have happened more in those days than it does today. Um, I also, this definitely doesn't happen today. I went through the yellow pages of the New York City phone book and made cold calls. And um, that was actually how I ended up getting an interview at Abrams and ended up getting that job. So today, um, it's a whole different world, right? Uh, you can go onto LinkedIn, you can look at um, online listservs, you can go to uh, publishing houses, job sites. I'm, I'm certain that the museums have one and I'm pretty sure that Chronicle has one as well. So um, I think being open-minded as you approach different things and taking, you know, taking something that you like, but taking what, um, what is available and, and not necessarily saying, oh, I don't want to do this one thing. I want to do something else, but seeing how that one thing can turn into something, something else. Wonderful. Um, what is the most rewarding part about being a director of publications? And what is the most challenging? Well, um, as you might guess, making a book of several hundred pages filled with uh, what needs to be precise text and uh, perfectly color balanced and cropped images, uh, every book is an enormous challenge. And we're a very small office. We publish, uh, we, we were publishing up to 20 books a year. That has come down. I think on average, we've been publishing about 10 books a year. And we're a team of six. Uh, we have a publishing associate, we have an editorial assistant, we have two editors and a managing editor and myself. 
um, was that six? Um, so we're a small office and we do a lot and that is really challenging. But I would say that, um, you know, the work is very rich. It's very rewarding work, um, just like Melissa. And efforts that you made. And um, I think that can be a very rewarding experience. Uh, the book kind of serves as a document of the work that you did for many months and sometimes years. Thank you. And um, if you, uh, you know, being that there, there's so much, there, there's a lot of people that you work with, um, what would you say is like one of the biggest tips that you can give to our teams uh, let's say they're applying for a job and they're starting off uh, in a publishing company, like what are some tips that you can give them? Well, one thing that I really love is the information interview. And I, I give information interviews when, when asked, probably because I don't get too many asks. Um, I know that other uh, of my colleagues in publishing kind of have the opposite rule and they don't, they don't do that. Um, but I really, really think that the informational interview is such a good way to learn about a particular job, a particular field, a particular uh, business or institution. It's also a way to get your foot in the door with someone. Uh, when we have a job opening, we, we do consider people who we know in the field among people we don't know who come in through the website. And um, it's always kind of nice to, to see that someone who's applying for a job had expressed interest. Maybe it was two years ago, maybe it was three or four years ago. Uh, so I really, really recommend the, um, the informational interview. Um, it's a really easy thing to do and it doesn't take a lot of time, but it can, it can be very uh, beneficial both in what you learn and in the, the contact that, that you make with a particular person or a particular place. I think another piece of advice that I would say is um, uh, there's not really, there are some publishing uh, programs that you can go into and you can get editorial skills. I'm actually myself working in a design program right now. Um, so there, there are things like that that you can do. There's a National Museum Publishing Seminar that takes place every other year um, that's done through the University of Chicago. And that's something that is a great way to learn. Um, but I would say, I guess this would be general, uh, my general advice, no matter what, but you can always learn. There's always something to learn. Um, I've been working in this role for nearly 10 years and I learn something every day now. Uh, maybe I don't learn as much today as I did when I was first starting out, but um, there's just always something and um, I'm fortunate to be surrounded by colleagues who can help me learn and teach me things. And um, I, I think that just always being open to learning is helpful. Thank you. I, I know we're pressed for time, so I'll go ahead and I'll ask one more question and then we'll open it up for the Q&A with our audience. My one question for you is, if you could turn back time to your teenage self, what is one advice you wish you could tell yourself? Or what is something you wish you could tell yourself? Yeah, I think about this a lot. Um, as you get older, you, you start to wonder, how did I get here? <laughs> uh, what could I have done? And instead, and you think about these chapters of a life un unlived and the life that you did live. And I think that um, what I would say, both for what I have done and what I haven't done, is um, to really, you know, if you have a passion, if you have a talent, or you, you have something, and maybe you don't even know it's a passion or a talent, but you want to do it, um, to pursue that, to really give that its place. And um, I think that sometimes you may go into classes or you may go into critiques and um, you, you'll find that some people really identify with what you're doing and, and some people don't. And I, I think um, being able to recognize criticism for you know, when it's helpful and when it isn't and standing true to the vision that you might have for yourself. I think that uh, it can feel like a very secret thing sometimes. And it's sometimes because of that easy to let it go or think it doesn't matter. But I would say it does matter. And there's a reason why that you're, you're thinking what you're thinking and um, to persevere with it, I would say. Thank you, that's amazing advice. And I hope our audience members, uh, everyone here uh, will look to that advice. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, I saw a question earlier from Helen. 
She asked here, and this is for you, Leslie, um, is it common, or, or even to, uh, for Melissa as well, is it common to start in other departments and then move into editorial? Um, I can go ahead, and Melissa, I'm sure you have some thoughts on it too. Mm -hmm. Just using myself as an example, I, I didn't even move from like one thing into editorial. I kind of did a lot of different things. Um, I know that sometimes at publishing houses, there is a concern that someone's coming in in another role and that they just want to be an editor because I think editor, Melissa, you can speak to this as an editor, uh, is kind of the glittery role. And it, it, it may be that, but it's also the role that everyone thinks of and they're not thinking about the other, the other roles. I would say that there is a lot of really interesting aspects to all the different jobs in publishing. And I think some people are, they're real wordsmiths and they're tailored to be an editor, absolutely. Uh, but I think some people have a really wonderful design sensibility. Some people are fantastic marketers. Um, so it's really finding, finding your niche. And if you are in one spot and it doesn't feel right, um, I, I've certainly seen people who have moved, moved around. I've seen editors turn into marketers. I, I've seen it go in all different directions, so. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I think it's, it's more likely for, um, for us to hire somebody into an editorial assistant role who comes from our fellowship than it is for us to hire somebody into an editorial assistant role who comes from marketing or sales or some other part of the company, but it does happen. So Thank who knows? <laughs> Lauren here asked them, how involved are the curators? Are they responsible for the text of the books? I'm assuming this one's for you, Leslie. Yes, that is a very excellent question. Um, our curators really drive our program. Um, Melissa, in your world, the editors drive the book program. In my world, the curators drive the, the whole curatorial program. The exhibitions, the care for objects in our permanent collection, the educational programming, and of course, the publishing. So um, unlike Melissa, who can kind of choose her you know, choose the projects that are interesting to her. My projects are handed to me by the curatorial program. And so someone will have, they will go through a process similar to what you described, Melissa, for a book at Chronicle. They'll go through a process to make their project worthwhile, like to, uh, to get a green lighted exhibition or a permanent collection reinstallation. And as a part of that, they will usually want to have a book and then there will be a conversation as to whether a book is necessary or there's there already a book about this subject matter how critical is this to our mission do we need you know what do we have the bandwidth to do it among everything else we're doing so the curators really do drive drive the program and when i say that i am a service provider at the museums i'm really a service provider to the curators and um, that's sort of how our whole program is run and they are contributors to the catalogs that they present and we will sometimes also work with some outside authors who are other specialists within the field uh, usually who the curators already know and recommend um, sometimes it falls to our office or others to make recommendations but they usually you know they are experts in their field and they know they know what their um, they know their community the best Wonderful. Um, can I ask, how has this pandemic affected both of your jobs? Are you working from, are you able to work from home? Yeah, I'm working from home. It's, um, it's harder to focus. I feel pretty behind. Um, but uh, obviously, a lot of people have it much worse. So I'm very grateful for the chance to work at home and, and stay safe. And I am working at home also and have been since probably the same as you, Melissa, mid-March. And our museums have been closed. Um, we had some hopeful news recently that we would open on July 7th. And then, of course, we all know that things have kind of changed. And um, mm -hmm. so I think for, for me, the, the challenge has just been staying on top of what happens next. And our publishing really... Um, 
it flows with the exhibition schedule. And since we don't know what the exhibition schedule is, we're, we're not quite sure <laughs> what we have to put first and, and when, when things will need to be done. And of course, you're probably seeing this too, Melissa, there have been some, some issues with distribution and getting books yeah. you know, out of other countries into, into our country. Uh, I had just printed three books at the end of February and they just uh, left Germany kind of just before the ports started closing there. So we were lucky, but I've heard all kinds of stories of books mm -hmm. that are, you know, on the water and uh, museum shows that aren't going to happen for those books, et cetera. Yeah, you never know. One time our books were on a, one, one of those big container ships across the Pacific because we printed in China and a storm struck and the ship broke in half and sank. The crew was fine, thank God, but all of the books were gone. <laughs> I didn't realize those ships could break in half. Yikes. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that. I hope, uh, yeah, I hope you guys were able to get a reshipment of those books and that they'll, that they printed new ones for you. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Are there um, any other pressing questions? Um, I know we're, 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 you know, we're out of time here, but um, let's see if there's any. Oh, I saw one, I guess this is more <laughs> for Melissa, but, uh, and <laughs> this is maybe not a great last question. It seems like it could be more in depth, but if you can sum up for us, what makes a good children's book? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> truly so many different things. There are so many different ways to write a good book. There are certainly a lot of different ways to write a bad book too, and I'm sure you've noticed some of them. Um, but I think, I guess the, if, there's, if there's a common thread, it starts with respect for children and really caring about caring about their interests caring about uh their their abilities and and really believing that they are already people we get a lot of submissions from people who seem to sort of remember children as maybe like not not completely human yet and <sighs> So um, start with your reader and uh, go from there. Thank you. I see I can ask this question for Leslie too. Leslie, what makes a, a good book for, for your museum? Well, there are different books for different subject matters, of course. Um, I mentioned the Contemporary Muslim Fashions book just because it was a book that didn't really exist already. And so to me, that makes a really great book when you can um, open up a subject matter to your readers that they didn't have access to before. Uh, and you can do it in a way that's really engaging and, and vibrant. Uh, we've had some books where we have, have done kind of the scholarly catalog for its lifetime, you know, for the 20 years that it will be in, you know, the kind of considered the book. Uh, we did one for the Brothers Lenin, who are these French uh, 17th century painters. We did another one recently for James Tiso, which is actually out in, in the trade now. So you can, you can find that on your bookshelves. But that was a case where a book about that artist had not been done in more than 20 years. So, and I think when we have that opportunity to, um, when we have a book like that, we really throw ourselves into it. And when it's something that, oh, we have a show, there are a lot of books on this, but we'll do a, a slightly different angle, we might not make as big of a book. Um, but I think always finding new stories to tell and um, very appealing ways to, to tell those stories would make a good art history, art book. Thank you for sharing that. All right. Uh, well, I guess we are towards the end of our program here, but I'd like to mention again, um, you know, if you guys have time to fill out the surveys, please do. We did attach a link to two of them. Um, I'd like to thank Melissa and Leslie for giving us, uh, you know, all of this wonderful information and for sharing their time with us today. Um, I hope that you took something away today from learning how to get your book published to, you know, to even working at a publishing house or, uh, and um, if there's any other questions or any 
other things that you'd like to, to ask us. We're going to hang out here for a little bit. Um, I'd like to mention that um, next week we are going to have a topic. Uh, we have two guest speakers and our topic next week is going to be uh, small businesses. So if you're interested in learning how to start your own business, come to our program next week. And another thing I'd like to mention is starting this fall, uh, we are going to be introducing a healthcare series. So um, I will be sending out a survey for that one next week. Um, if there's any health topics you'd like to learn about, uh, I would love to get your feedback so I can find guest speakers and doctors and physicians and specialists to come and talk more about um, these health topics. Okay, thanks everybody. We'll hang. Oh, mental health. Okay, we, I got you. <laughs> We're, we'll get Jessica's husband <laughs> in on this. Um, yeah, so we'll hang out here for a little bit, but we're going to go ahead and con conclude the program. Again, thank you for coming today. We'll see you guys next week on Wednesday at 4 30. Hey, Greg. <laughs> hey, Greg. Hello, guys. That was an amazing program, by the way. Oh. Thank you so much, Leslie. And for all of that info. I'll let you guys, uh, I'll let all four of you know once I have my own books published. Oh, I'll let you yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> Plan.